All right. Praise the Lord. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I'm excited. I hope you are as excited as I am. There's some things I've got to get used to. You notice I have a different pulpit. Yeah. Yeah, well, the other one was kind of low. And if you notice, I'm always looking down. I even tried pushing my hat up so that it would get more light, you know, so occasionally you'd see my eyes or something. But with the pulpit down like this, it was always down here and you've seen the top of my head. So I'm trying a new thing here. So y'all have to just bear with me here while I get everything reorganized. Because I'll tell you what, I believe I have a message for you this morning that will. And, and I know y'all miss me because so many people come up. You haven't preached in three weeks. It's so good to know you miss me. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, I want you to open your Bibles this morning, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. I know it's one we always go to. My favorites are Ephesians and Romans and Galatians and Colossians. And the list goes on and on because I love my calendar or my, my compass. I love my compass because it always lead me in the right direction. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what situation comes my way, when I open up my compass, it's always amazing to me how the Holy Spirit just opens my spiritual eyes and I see exactly what I need at that moment. Now, that doesn't mean it comes right now. God doesn't operate that way all the time. We all know that, right? Amen. And so there's times we have to keep searching, keep searching. See, he says that we are to diligently seek after him. Now, that diligently means that we have to make a strong effort. We can't just pray once in a while. We can't just open up our Bible once a week or twice a week and think that's enough. Because it's not. It's never enough. It's never enough. I don't care if you read this seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It still ain't enough. But God knows that we don't have all that time. So he prepares that place for us when we do open up and we do sit down before him. Now he turns around and he shows through his Holy Spirit. That's why he placed him in us. So that we'll have the word in us and we have the living word with the Holy Spirit who is the teacher. He is the one who teaches us and leads us into all our understanding of what God has already done. I said what he's already done. See, so many times we're taught to pray, pray for whatever we need. Pray for what we need. Well, my Bible tells me that he knows what I need before I even ask. So most of the time, I look at it this way. I come before him, just as we did in song number three. I just want to praise you. I just want to thank you. You know what? I'm a happy boy because of my Jesus. I can live a happy life. I can live a, an, an encouraging life that others want to know what I know, that others want to live like I live. You know, they see all this stuff going on in the world today, and they wonder what the heck's going on. Our young people are wondering what's going on. And yes, we've got some that are trying to stand up now and get their voices out there, but there's not enough of us. That's not what I'm preaching on today. <laughs> but I am going to preach on two things that are very, very important to us as believers. And people who are not believers need to hear this message and understand that God is a God of grace and God is a faithful God. And I've heard it mentioned and I've heard it preached, grace is the way to salvation. And I've heard this one over here preach, faith is the way to salvation. But my Bible says that we come by grace through faith. See, if it's not, if it, it, it's all grace because God has already prepared the way. God has already done what God's going to do. You're not going to put Jesus back on the cross. Amen. You bet. Hallelujah. Amen. It ain't happening. Why? Because the work is done. See, he went up into heaven and sat down. When you sit down, the work's done. So now we need to operate in that work. And how do we do that? By grace, through faith. Faith is our positive response. Now listen closely. It's our positive response to what God has already done. 
See, salvation was 2,000 years ago. It wasn't today. If you, today was your day to receive Christ. It's not today. It was 2,000 years ago. And when you're praying for something, it's not today. It's 2,000 years ago. For those of you that are battling a cold or battling the flu or battling whatever it is within your physical body, that was already taken care of 2,000 years ago. See, that's where we need to come to this understanding of who we are in Christ, what Christ has done. He's already done that work. He bore our sicknesses and diseases upon his back. Whew, come on. Ephesians 3.20 tells us, now you, don't, don't, you can look there because you're going to Ephesians anyway. I'm going to be reading out of Ephesians chapter 2 today. But in 3, it says in verse 20, Now to him, God, who is able to do, listen, exceedingly abundantly above all, above all. I said above all that we could ask or even think. But how does he operate? According to the power that works in us. Uh Oh, So this means I need to be a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, don't I? Because, see, that's when the Holy Spirit takes up residence. He is the power of God. He is the living word of God that's in us and wants to operate through us. See, he gives us the wisdom and the knowledge of God's power, God's wisdom, God's grace. And then he turns around and says, now act on the faith that it's already done. See, this is where we sometimes have our problem. Well, you don't understand. God doesn't always see what I'm going through. The heck he doesn't. According to, that's an important word right there. According to. It's used here, it means in proportion to. Did you hear that? It's in proportion to who's already in you. What he's already done for you. What he's going to do through you. We heard a testimony of Bonnie last week. Yes, it was lengthy. Oh, but man, did you see on every page at every moment throughout that time of that testimony? But God, but God, but God, but my faithful friends who believe in the word of God, who shared the word of God, who gave me songs, gave me word so that I could meditate on the word. And what happened? She's healed. Come on. I don't want to hear one of you saying in your mind right now, well, that was hers. He didn't always heal everybody. Well, see, that's what happens when we don't have our compass directly north. Because then the the man of the world who thinks he knows it all and thinks he has the power over God, his name is Satan. He comes in and tries to steal, kill, and destroy what God has already provided for us. Ooh, doggy. Come on. In other words, you can say that this way. In proportion to the power that works in us or to the full degree of the power that's already in us. So if the power is already in us, how do we activate that power? By faith. Whether we see it, smell it, taste it, feel it, touch it, doesn't matter. It's what I know to be truth. As Eric was sharing this morning, it's the word of truth. What does God say? Which way is the right way to go? Ask God. What am I, if I, I'm, I'm trying to make a decision of something that includes my family or is, involves my family and I want to make sure I make a good decision, how am I going to do that? Where am I going to go for advice? Open your compass. And watch God direct you. Watch the spirit that's living in you direct you in many different ways. But he'll always directly to to direct north. Amen? Thank you, Eric, for that this morning. Do we flow in the fullness of power? See, this question we have. Do we flow? That dwells within us through Christ? See, there again, it's all about Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me the raised son of God, the one who's sitting at the right hand of God. It's all about him by faith in his finished work. Or do we act on our own rather than following the compass? It feels like I'm supposed to go to the right, but the compass says I'm supposed to go straight ahead. What choice will we make? 
Will we follow the compass? Will we follow the, the word of God? Or will we bend because I think it would be easier for me to do it this way? You see, God is mighty, but he will not flow without you. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Isn't God all sovereignty? Yes, he is. But see, that's why he put his word in us. That's why he put his Holy Spirit in us. That's why Jesus paid the price so that we could be, we could walk in liberty. We could walk in freedom to believe and trust and know the word of God is true. See, this is what it's all about. Now, when we know that and we put it to work, now God can release the word that he's already provided 2,000 years ago. And now it starts to flow. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to take that. If, if there's no power working in us, then there's no manifestation of God's power. If there's no power working in us, then we will never see the manifestation of God. Why? Because of doubt and unbelief. If I don't believe it, how will I ever see it? See, God wants me to see it. You go, well, that's what I keep waiting for. I keep waiting for him to put that million bucks in my checking account. I keep waiting for him to pay my electric bill. Forget the million dollars. Take care of my electric bill. Are we operating by faith or are we operating as the world operates? See, the power that is in us, the faith and the truth and understanding of, what God, of God's word, it says that he's already provided all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Who come on. See, we have to act because of what has already been provided and by faith. Ever wonder what would have happened? Just think about this. This came to me last night as I was rereading for the umpteenth time. Ever wonder what would have happened if Jesus didn't believe all that God promised him? Where would we be today? We wouldn't be here. We'd still be searching. We'd still be searching for light. We'd still be searching for a better way because we'd have no hope. Our hope is in Christ. But ever thought about that? If he'd had one, just, just think if he'd been, when he was on the cross and he looked out there and seen you and I and just had one itsy bitsy thought about how wrong and how he doesn't have to pay for my sin. He doesn't have to take this upon him. If he'd had one thought of unbelief, all done and over with, Satan wins. But I'm here to tell you today, Satan is the loser because my Jesus won. Open your Bibles, open your compass to chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 4. And we're going to, we're going to read this all the way through verse 10. And then we're going to go and, and we're going to feed on each one for just a little bit of what, what the Apostle Paul here is, is revealing to me that I want to reveal to you so that when you see these times the way they are and the, the economy the way it, that it is and everything, I, want, I don't want you to look at it the way the world looks at it. I want you to look at it through the eyes of God who has provided all your needs according to his riches and glory. So let's start in verse 4. But God, hallelujah. You know, if it's talking up there, my, well, uh, the flesh and, and, and what we didn't desire and, or de uh, deserve and so on and so forth. But it says here, this is what we do. Oh, let me add this in. If you look at the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters are all about the blessings of God. Have you ever noticed that? All three, the first three chapters are all about the blessings. The rest of the chapters are all about how to use them. Because they've already been given. So if they've already been given, aren't they mine to use? Aren't they yours to use, to put to use in your life? See, we need to know what is ours so that we can put it to use. And then we worship and praise God no matter what our situation is. So let's start in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together 
with Christ. And in parentheses, it says, by grace, you have been saved. Verse 6 goes on and says, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any one of us should boast. For we are his workmanship. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Amen. Father, I thank you this morning for the gift of your word the gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we meditate on your word this morning, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would open up our spiritual eyes and ears to hear exactly what you want us to hear. And then not only be hearers, but be doers to take that word and put it into active service in our lives and allow you to reveal your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, your grace, so that no matter what we get into, we can see your hand at work, that you've already uh, uh, made a light unto our path. Father, you've already given us the living word that is sharper than any two-edged sword, and the enemy has no power over us when we walk in the blessing in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So, Father, as we meditate this morning, give us revelation of understanding. And, Father, we will bless and honor and glorify the name of Jesus in all we do and say, for it's in his name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. So, God's grace, grace is God's part, and faith is our part. So when it says you're saved by grace through faith, God supplies the grace, we turn around and we act on that grace by faith. Now, faith means that I trust in what he's done. Amen? Faith is not something we do to get God to respond to us. I don't care how hard you pray. I don't care how much you cry. I don't care how much you go into theatrics trying to get God to listen to you. We need to be people who walk by faith. What has he already blessed me with? We're going to see in these first chapters of Ephesians here is that all the blessings are already laid out. They're there. All we have to know. You've heard me say so many times when we, when we take communion, everybody calls this the table of grace, and it is. But it's not just the bread and the wine that's in the middle of that, that table. It's all the blessings of God in Christ Jesus are on the table. What we need to do is find out what is ours, which all of it is, by the way, and take what you need. I said, take what you need. Oh, no, wait a minute, I got to do something. No, it's already done. See, this is the blessing of God. This is understanding who we are in Christ. He already paid the price for it. If I'm a heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, I'm in the family. What his is mine. What's mine is his. Amen. Our, our faith does not move God, but it does allow God to release what he's already provided for us. He releases what's already there. Amen? In verse 4 there it says, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead. Now listen, this happened before you were born again. See, even when we were dead in our trespasses, or in our uh, trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ Jesus. See, he foreknew. Now, we know as we read the Bible and understand through teaching that this all began before he ever created the world. Now, now we're talking about the intelligence of God here. That God already foreknew. Now, he didn't put sin on this earth for you and I to fall into. So that his word would, you would see, oh yeah, God did this because, or God allowed this to happen because he wants to prove something to me, or he wants me to be a blessing to somebody else and how I can help. Come on, get over that stuff. God does not work like that. See, his name is what? His name is love. 
His name's not sin. His name's not hardship. His name's not down and out in the mud. His name is lifted up and glorious. We call him, we call him uh, Elohim. He is almighty God. He's the God of love, the God of truth. There is no lie in him. It says so in the Bible. I read that. And guess what? I believe it. So that means that whatever he says is mine, it's mine. And I'm going for it. I want you to have that same understanding of who you are in Christ and go for it. But see, it's not just, well, I ran, you know, I, I've started exercising. I know you can't tell yet, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm running my race. My goal is to take all this excess and wash it away. Why? Because this is the temple of the living God. God resides, the spirit of God resides here. And I'm called to take care of this temple. Amen? So part of that is watching what I do with it. And so I'm to keep it active. It's just the same way with my spirit, man. I'm to keep him active in the word. So that way, when something comes up, my spirit man has the answer. And my soul man just goes, oh, okay. Now, y'all know how I am on that soul man. See, he, he's an eternal being too. You know, we're, we have a spirit and we have a soul and we live in a body. And now both the soul and the spirit are eternal. So once we're raised up in Christ, our eternal man, our spirit man is raised up. Now, this is the one that's supposed to teach the soul man who's been running wild. And now we take our lasso out and we put a rein on him and we drag him down and put him in the dirt where he belongs and tie him up and say, now you waiting on Jesus because he's my answer. He's my way of life. He's the one I have faith in. You've already proven there's no faith in the world. There's no absolutes in this world except one. His name is Jesus. Amen. Uh, over there in chapter one, verse three, it says, listen, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, who has, I know you hear me say that all the time, has, what does it mean? It's already done. He's already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It doesn't stop there, does it? And some of you are going, well, I'm not looking at my compass right now because I'm looking in chapter 2. Bless your heart. But in chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Where's your blessing? In Christ. So we being in Christ already possess the blessings of Christ because we're in Christ. Amen? Amen? Who has blessed us? That means that there's a point in the past where all these blessings were already obtained for you and I. They're already on the table. Paul is describing to us what is already ours. These are not blessings to be sought after by works, but by blessings. Be or by begging God to do something, which I've already talked about, but rather blessings to be discovered. How do you discover it? In the word. See, when I get in the word and I study the word, the word turns around and gives me revelation, gives me understanding, gives me wisdom. Now I can put it to work. Now when I put it to work, it becomes a revelation and I see God manifested through his word. Now I can sit up and go, yippee! I found it. I found it. I found the key. No, that's only one key. There's so many more. Keep searching. Keep searching. Those who have put their trust or their faith in Christ are not headed to victory. You hear me say this all the time also, but we're headed from victory. See, we have to remember who we are in Christ. Is Christ a victorious one? Did, did Christ defeat Satan? Or is, it, or is it sometime in the future? Because we know, you know, there's things that's going to happen in the future. And we know, you know, eventually Christ is going to put him in, the gra in a pit and lock him up for a thousand years. But in the meantime, he's still operating. Yes, he is. But see, what we need to understand that we have the victory. By faith, I'm victorious. I've already overcome. Why? Because my Savior did. 
So whatever I'm going through, I'm going to go through knowing who I am in Christ. And I've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Don't ever forget that. We always say in heavenly places, but it's not true. It's only in heavenly places when we understand that it's in Christ that we have those blessings and have that favor of God. Our part is by faith. To act on what has already been done for us, we can walk into the finished work of Jesus Christ by faith, knowing we are victorious. I've shared this with you before. I'm a person of vision, and God knows that. And so there have been times in my life where he has put me in a position where it came to, you know, even though you heard bones crack, I mean, so loud, it was almost ear piercing. And you know in your mind, bone broke. But the Spirit of God says, go and lay hands. And you move by faith because you were told by the Spirit to go and lay hands. And when I laid my hands, I seen those bones all come back together. I believe that's what Paul is referring to. He's talking about those things that are not seen. Well, what about the things that are seen? See, God wants us to see something that is, you can't see because there's all this flesh around it. But in my spirit, I seen those bones coming back to, to formation. And of course, the woman ended up in the hospital. They took her by ambulance because everybody's running around, 911, 911. I'm going, come on, Jesus. Because that's all I need. Come on, Jesus. And he was the one that was telling me, or the Holy Spirit was, telling me to lay hands on her. So I already knew what the outcome was. Why? Because I'd seen it. We need to learn to see. We need to learn to see. Now we can see by faith that it's already done. When, when you're asking God for a healing, which he's already provided, and you and I both know that, but you're asking God, you're searching the word for words of healing. Do you see your healing already take place or are you still waiting for it to appear? See, by faith, we should already see it. Why? Because the word says so. First Corinthians chapter 15, 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, victory in Jesus. Let me tell you something. That's not just a good old song. This is true fact. Oh, victory in Jesus. Oh, victory in my Lord. I have victory. I'm walking in victory because he has, has already uh, defeated all of my enemies. Come on. A way of life that can change our way of thinking and living, but not by works of the flesh, but by walking and speaking the word of truth. You know that I don't, I, I try not to anymore, but it still slips out. How you doing? <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you. I really don't want to know. <laughs> but I do it in a loving manner. I really want to know how you doing. And, I, and so I've changed it. How has Jesus blessed you this week? How has he revealed himself to you this week? Come on, give him glory. Shout it out. You know, that's what we need to do. Why? Because he's already paid for it. It's already done. It's already ours. So we need to see it, walk in it, and speak about it. Quit speaking about your prescriptions and your doctor's report. I got a good doctor's report. It's right here. Now, I know things happen. Come on, I'm not dumb. I'm not up here going, oh, I'm going to change your mind that everything's taken care of and all this is done. No, it's a process. Come on, when you were saved, why didn't they take you right to heaven? Why did Jesus pray in the garden that night? Father, don't take them out of this world, but keep them Listen, listen, keep them from the evil one. Oh, oh, see, see, see there? No, no, Satan's attacking me all the time. That's not what Jesus meant. And Jesus himself said, in this world, you're going to have trials and tribulations. Now, wait a minute. How can the man that said, 
keep them from the evil one, also turn around and say, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. See, again, he didn't stop there. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. See, there's where our focus is. He's overcome whatever I'm going through. He's already dealt with. And I can too in the same process. How is that? By having faith in the finished work of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Period. I don't care about the pain. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. All I care about is what does the word say? Then I rejoice. <sighs> Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. That sight is the natural sight. In other words, I don't feel it, taste it, smell it, uh, whatever that, the rest of it is. But anyway, it's not in the natural, it's in the supernatural. See, I'm born again. I'm a new creation. I sang a song for you. I'm a new creation. Everything in me is brand new. Why? Because of the one who paid the price so that I could walk in that freedom, that I could walk in that new creation, knowing, yeah, I'm going to have trials, but guess what? He's already defeated him. Come on. All of the promises of his word must be seen, heard, and understood. This is so important. It can't just be a hearer. We cannot be just hearers of the word. We have to act on the word. That's what we do by faith. So we go, well, by grace, we have all this. Yes, I understand that. But what good is the grace if we don't act by faith in what, what grace has already provided? See, we're waiting for God to do something God's already done. Come on. We're waiting for God to do something that he's already done. And he says, open up your compass. Open up the book of life. Listen to the blessings of what I've already provided. Now walk in those. Romans 10 verse 8 says, the word is near you in your mouth. It's amazing how Paul always brings speech into his message. Because if we're not speaking the word of truth, how will the word of truth ever go forth? How will anybody know? How will you even hear it and really understand it unless you hear yourself? I, I enjoy reading the Bible, and I don't just sit here and read. I read out loud because I want to hear what I'm saying. Because I know it's the spoken word that I hear and hold on to. Amen? It's confirmed. The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. These are the words of Paul. Verse 9, listen to this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be, you will be saved. Whew, that's a mouthful. That's a whole lot to take in of understanding. Amen? This doesn't just apply to your initial salvation. Listen, I've been around for a while. I received Jesus Christ at the age of 10. I've been in church since I was in diapers. I've heard the word of God preached over and over and over and over and over. It was so good. But when I got into the word of God and started seeking on my own, things that I heard didn't quite line up with what he was saying to me. And it, not that that was wrong, but it wasn't where I was at and what I needed and what I desired. I wanted more. Salvation, I always said, there's more to this than just salvation. And so many people preach salvation and send you on your way. I'll give you a little pat on the hiney. Go ahead. Hit the field. How many coaches would have winning teams if that's the way they felt? They turned around and said, okay, here's the play. Here's the next play. Go get them. No. See, God gives us full direction and understanding of what he's already provided. This is the way. If you run this race, this is how you get through. And these are the results. I'm already going to show you the results. But you got to run the race. And how do we run it? By faith, trusting in the word of God, that if God said it, I believe it. It's mine. I'm in the family. 
In Colossians chapter 2, 6, it says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus. See, if you've already received Christ, so walk in him. Does this mean we only walk as saved? <laughs> well, it got quiet in here. Does this mean that we only walk as many, that as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk in him? Does this mean we only walk as saved? No. Is that all Jesus did? No. That's what I don't understand. Well, Jesus did, didn't come to save. He came to redeem people. He came to heal, save, and redeem. From what? From all the tyranny of the world. Or does this mean we just walk as Jesus walked in faith, fulfilling all the works of the Father? See, that's the part I believe. I believe we're called to walk by faith. If Jesus did it, I can do it. If Jesus tells me to do it, the Spirit of God tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. I don't care what people say. And I've had them say it. How can you do that? Who do you think you are? I'm nobody. But I'll tell you who's inside me. Greatest man ever walked this earth. He is the son of the living God. And he instructed me to do what I'm doing or say what I'm saying. And through his words, things will happen. Does this mean we walk as Jesus walked in faith, fulfilling all the works of the Father? Absolutely. Paul says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. See, if we walk in the teaching of Paul and understand what Paul was teaching us through his teaching, he's saying whatever Jesus has done, does, you can do also. Whatever Jesus did, Paul did. Did Paul not heal? Did Paul not save? Did Paul not raise the dead? Did, not Paul, did Paul not walk in, in, in faith in the word of God? He did all the time. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love has, or excuse me, great love with which he loved us. Listen to the amplified version of that. But God so rich in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. See, it's all about love. The Lord wasn't motivated to save us because, we, because of obligation or duty or responsibility or even pity. <laughs> it was his intense love. We all know John 3.16. See, I think sometimes we forget who God is. Well, you know, he, he put this sickness on me. And I was watching a movie last night. And by the way, if you ever get a chance to run, it's called Running the Basis. It's a Christian movie. Really good. Very powerful. About a young boy who was a baseball player. Him and his twin brother and his twin mother died. And um, he found out he had the same disease. And... Uh, but anyway, throughout this movie, we could see, you could see the hand of God working in mysterious ways. And just all of a sudden at the end, he gets this revelation of what God, that God has been there all that time. The words that he says that I'll never leave you nor forsake you are true. Let me tell you, they are true. Not just in some movie or somebody else's life, it's true in your life. He will not leave you nor forsake you. But see, we need to have faith in him. He has faith in us because he put his faith in us. He gave to each one of us the measure, which is his measure of faith, not ours. So we can't say, well, I only have this much. I know you got all this up here, but me, I've only got this much. No. See, Satan's trying to tell you you haven't got enough faith to get her done. And you're believing the lie. God says, I've given you the measure, the fullness of God's faith is living and dwelling in each and every one of us. Amen? He wasn't motivated to save us because of all these things. In Ephesians, it tells us, because he describes the hopeless condition of the world in verse 3 of chapter 2, which we didn't read. Listen, in which you once walked according to the course of the word, a world according to the prince of the power of air, the spirit who now walk, works in the sons of disobedience. So that's the way we were, yet God loved us. 
Yes, he gave us a choice. I don't believe in all that teaching that God chose us and we had nothing to do with it because that would go against everything Jesus did. My Bible tells me he's still standing at the door knocking. Well, why is he knocking if he already put you in his bosom? Doesn't make sense to me, but I understand it. But thanks to God, Paul didn't stop there. He said in verse 4, but God. This is the 180 degree turn that Frank and I are always talking about. But God. No matter, no matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstance, if you bring God into it, there's going to be a change. There has to be. Because it says, but God, who was rich in love and mercy and grace, he turned around and provided us a way out of that that, that darkness and that sin-filled life. See, we, weren't, we, we didn't do anything to earn it. He just did it. <laughs> so why do I have to go through all these rituals to get something from God? When my Bible says he's already provided it. So what do I need to do? Receive it. The same way, same way we received salvation. By believing in Jesus Christ. It does not mean, or it does mean he has already made or provided a way through when we act on his grace by faith. It's not grace alone. Neither is it by faith alone. It's both. What he has provided, we respond to by faith. That it's ours, that it's already taken care of. These two gifts, God must never, uh, I believe God does never want separated. And there are many people that are preaching that it's separated. And it's not. Amen? Uh, verse 5 of, uh, of uh, Ephesians 2 says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, you, you've got to grab onto that. Even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ by grace. See, he foreseen. But remember back in Deuteronomy, he says, I lay before you. Blessings and cursings, life and death, here it comes. You choose. Well, if God does the choosing, then God's a liar. Because he just said, you choose. Here's life, here's death. Here's my son, here's a world of sinless or sin, sin, sinning. Which one do you want? You want this life or this life? You choose. See, God gave us a choice. That's how much he loves us. He wants us to act. He wants us to make a decision. Which one will you choose? Which way will you go? Look at verse 6. And raised us up together. Oh, come on. He raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places. Where are you sitting today? You go, well, I'm sitting right here. No, you're not. Yeah, you are in the natural. I, I, can't, I can't deny that. There you are. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. We're all here. But the Bible says that we're already seated in heavenly places. Right next to guess who? Jesus Christ. The one who made the way so we could come and sit in the presence of Almighty God. So we're talking spirit, aren't we? So if we're talking our spirit man is already seated in heavenly places, why aren't we operating in the spirit like he is up there instead of we do down here? To be raised together with Christ and made to sit together in heavenly places indicates not only location. I just shared to you the location. We're already seated in heavenly places, but also in a position of authority. Did you hear that? In the position of authority. Why? Because we're in Christ. We're in the one who paid the way. We're in the one who fulfilled all the works that God wanted him to do, that needed him to do, so that you and I could follow behind him and do exactly what he did and honor and glorify him through our actions and through our words and through our understanding so that others will come to that understanding of who Christ is. Amen? What is true of him is also true of us. We are born again spirits. 
We always want to operate from here. I got to think this through. I got to meditate here. See, it says to meditate on what? On the word. What does the word say? Because see, the mind will be deceived, will deceive you in the things that are physical rather than the things that are spiritual. That's why I always believed after uh, my revelation of God speaking it through Isaiah 58 or, or 55 verse 8. It says, my ways are higher, your, and my, my ways and my thoughts are higher than your ways and thoughts. Paraphrased. He wasn't saying, oh, I'm God, and you're just a puny old man. You don't know nothing. That's not what he said. And right away, I look at it, and I'm going, oh, yeah, you're God. Your ways are higher. No, that's not what he's saying. Go back and read the beginning of the chapter. God wants us in that position. Come on up here. See, this is why in Christ we're already seated in heavenly places. This is where we give our, get our understanding of what's already been provided. See, if we know and see and act on what's already been provided, in our natural man we'll do identically the same thing. And we'll glorify God in everything we do. Ooh, man. And then it talks about in verse 7 there, it says that in the ages that come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I was looking at that word kindness, and it's talked about in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. If you want to turn there, it's right after 2 Timothy. Starting in verse 4, it says, And when the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Mercy is not getting all the bad things we deserve. Grace is getting all the good things we don't deserve. We get all the things we don't deserve. Why? Because it was all completed in Christ. Because of the love of God. Because of his grace and his mercy. He put all that pain and suffering on his son so that you and I would not. Listen, you've heard me say this before and I had it confirmed the other day. I can't remember who said it. I think it was Andrew Womack. But anyway, he, he said it this way. All the sins of the world has already been dealt with and paid for. Every man, woman, and child's name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It has to be. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for all men. Past, present, future. Done deal. Wiped out. Covered in the blood of Jesus. Amen? But we also know that we still have a life to live. We have air to breathe. We have an opportunity to recognize and receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior up until that last moment. And after that, it's blotted out. Why? They made a bad choice. I lay before you blessings, cursings, life, and death. You choose. Amen? We're talking about the same power that raised Jesus from the grave, grave is the same power that is living in each and every one of you. I don't know if we really truly understand the power that dwells within us. Because if we did, we'd be searching the word no matter what our circumstances, no matter what this world is bringing at us. We can search the word and find that, 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 that understanding of who we are and that that power to change whatever is happening is already in you. You have the power to change it. Same way you had a power to change who you were. You no longer cuss like you used to. Come on, guys. And some of you women were pretty good at it too. But what changed? I changed inside. And we keep changing and changing. <clears throat> we must learn to, in verse 7 it says, and having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are heirs. It goes on to say later that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're already seated. Can you see all this from where we're at, where, where we're positioned in Christ, already seated in heavenly places? All the blessings and, and, and the love of God is already living. The power of God is already living and dwelling in each one of us. 
so that we have the power to say, you know, Jesus said, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in their heart will have what he has. So how do we move a mountain? Now, that mountain not necessarily means one of these big mountains that we have out here, but whatever it is that's coming against you, as we heard all the testimonies of Bonnie last week, mountain after mountain, and she even mentioned them as mountains, as mountains, as mountains. But she kept speaking to the mountain, speaking to the mountain, speaking to the mountain. Not just, oh, poor is me. No, here's the word of God, sucker. Now move. <laughs> you know, we, hey, we, we need to be that aggressive. We need to let this world, Satan know, the power of this world, let him know that we are sons of God, that we are followers of Christ, that Christ is in me, the word is in me. Here comes the word, move. You have no right in me. You have no power over me. I live for Christ and I live in Christ. Be gone. And that's it. I got more. <laughs> but I'm going to end with that. Because I want, I want us all to remember and understand who we are in Christ. We're not just saved Christians. We're just not, oh, you're one of those Christian people. No, I'm not just the Christian people. I am a man of God. I am a man that has been equipped for every challenge of this life that comes along. It's already been paid for. It's already been done through my Savior, Jesus Christ. I am an overcomer. Not because of what I have done, but because of what he has done and what he has provided for me. So I walk in that provision. Amen? He has given me, when we, when we do the job that we, that we have, that we, we're doing, where do we get that job? How do we get that job? And are we doing that job to honor and glorify Christ in all we do and say? Or are we just figuring, oh, it's just a job and I'm going to do the best I can and get as much as I can because I need that new truck. I need that new boat. I need that new uh, rifle. I need that new sealed weapon. I need these things. But God gave us those jobs. I love the testimony of, of Eric because I remember back when Eric wanted to quit teaching in the public school system. You don't hear that no more because he went before God and said, wherever you want me, whatever you need, I'm yours. I'll stick it out. And we need to do the same thing. We need to start speaking over our children, speaking over our homes, speaking over our automobiles before you get them and drive them. And like Eric said this morning, whatever you do, don't, don't speed. Because you'll outrun your angels. They're not going to break the law. Whoop. <laughs> now, now whether, whether that's really true or not or not, I don't know. But all I can say is it says that we are to, uh, to our, obey the laws of the land. And if it's got a speed limit sign up there, that means no, no further than this. No faster than this. Um, but some of us just say, well, you don't understand. I'm in such a hurry. <laughs> well, if you got up a little earlier, amen. Praise God. Well, I hope you got something out of this because of the fact that, you know, we, especially when we see these, these days coming, we need to stand in who we are in Christ, what he has done for us. You know, Satan's going to do his best to steal, kill, and destroy everything, all the works of Christ. But he can only do that if we let him. If he can get into our mind and tell us, well, he didn't take care of that. You see, see, you're still sick. See, see, you still got cancer. See, see, your leg's still broken. So where's the miracle of God? I'll tell you where the miracle of God is. It's in Christ Jesus. And my victory's already won. So that's where I stand, in victory. Amen?